so uh, what I am going to cover through a few cases, we've already had one, just the basic pathology characteristics of nutritional rickets, when to suspect non-nutritional rickets, uh, sorry, yes, please. And uh, how do you evaluate a child with non-nutritional rickets? How do you differentiate between the two broad categories of calcipenic and phosphopenic rickets? And very briefly touch upon the uh, management principles. So you are aware of normal bone formation. This is the growth plate uh, of a child where the bones are growing. So the basic thing that happens is uh, that sets the stage for bone formation is hypertrophy of the uh, uh, hypertrophy followed by apoptosis of the chondrocytes in the growth plate. And then once the apoptosis occurs, there is a mineralization that is the zone. Uh, in the zone of provisional calcification, followed by vascularization, progressive reabsorption, replacement by osteoid matrix, which undergoes again a secondary mineralization. So this is what is a normal bone. The basic problem that happens in rickets is a impaired apoptosis of the cartilage cells with delayed and inadequate mineralization. So two basic things are going on here. And once there is no apoptosis, the cartilage keeps growing. It becomes a haphazard mass. And the osteoid is laid on top of this uh, hypertrophic mass in a disorganized manner. And both provisional as well as secondary mineralization is suboptimal, ultimately leading to a weak and poorly formed bone, which leads to a deformation due to loss of structural integrity. And that is how we end up having bent bones and short stature. The two main uh, ways rickets presents in children are by deform bony deformity and short stature. Okay. So, but what causes this impaired apoptosis of the chondrocytes? The understanding now is whatever be the cause of rickets, the primary factor that drives the impaired apoptosis is hypophosphatemia. And this hypophosphatemia could, in case of phosphopenic rickets, occur because of primary phosphate wasting. While in calciopenic rickets, it occurs secondary to elevated PTH, which again induces renal phosphate wasting because it leads to degradation of the sodium-dependent phosphate co-transporter proteins in the proximal renal tubule, leading to a cantony-like state, what I mentioned earlier, as, which could also give rise to polyuria. So if hypophosphatemia is going to occur in both these situations, leading to the impaired apoptosis. Okay. So uh, let's uh, see this case. Something that very commonly will be seen by pediatricians all over. All over. So a 17-month-old child brought with inability to achieve walking but the previous milestones were okay. Otherwise, uh, all right in the past, no illness, no medication, no family history. Parents had a non-consanguinous marriage. Weight and height are on the lower uh, centiles, both on the fifth centile. The child had mild pallor, there were clinical signs of rickets, nothing else really. So, uh, uh, once uh, I recognize the fact that I'm talking to the DM students here, and you are unlikely to see these kind of children on the first go. But having said that, supposing he was to come to you for the first time and not having taken treatment anywhere else, what do you think is the likely cause here? And what do you think is the walking, why do you think walking is delayed? When such a child comes, what do you think of? Yeah, I would, uh, with a reasonable degree of confidence, make a diagnosis of nutritional rickets because my history has not given me any more clues, history or my examination. The child seems okay. And why is the walking delay? Yes, yes, very right. And often children with nutritional rickets do present at that age because the, the parents may miss the bony deformities unless they are very similar. In the, so this is actually a very, very typical or the garden variety kind of uh, case of records, very likely nutritional. So in such a case, we just need to undertake basic investigation to confirm the kids. We, we are reasonably safe in assuming these to be cases of nutritional records and treating them as such. And we must follow up to see response to therapy. So nutritional rickets, it's okay, but uh, when they come to you, well, 
you have to take that history how many times they've been seen by and treated by a pediatrician first so if they're coming to you for the first time it is quite okay to take them as nutritional records and and remember nutritional records is also a spectrum from pure vitamin D deficiency to pure calcium most of the cases are somewhere in between and if we see our own patients in India it's amply documented now not only are they low on vitamin D they are also low on because of their sun exposure related and uh, pollution and the skin pigmentation related issues we are also low on our dietary calcium intake and across socioeconomic status so uh, the poorer uh, patients can't afford calcium uh, milk and milk products the richer ones don't want to take it so food fads so uh, this uh, slide very beautifully demonstrates the relative contribution of uh, calcium and calcium intake and vitamin D in etiology of uh, nutritional rickets, wherein you actually require both. If both are doing great, and even if one of them, vitamin D status of the body or calcium intake is insufficient, we are doing great. If one of them is insufficient or deficient, but other one is normal. We are just about precariously balanced, just precariously. One is balanced, other one is less. But if both are insufficient or one is insufficient, one is deficient, then one cannot compensate for the other and frankly it suffers. And most of our patients, unfortunately, fall in this category that both of them are deficient. So uh, just to emphasize that clinical finding and rickets, nutritional rickets are also age dependent. So uh, in young infants under six months, so um, you hardly see any skeletal findings. They're very subtle. If you really look for them, you might find them. Uh, but most of the under six months would present you with it as hypocalcemic seizures. Other uncommon manifestations here would be stridor and dilated cardiomyopathy. But as the child gets older, second half of infancy to the uh, toddler age group, the florid manifestations of uh, rickets come up, which you are all familiar with. And uh, of course, at that age, the proximal myopathy would also uh, uh, become symptomatic. Again, once a child becomes adolescent, the skeletal findings again become a little subtle. And these patients again present with more with proximal myopathy, difficulty in walking, climbing stair, and lower limb pain, very non-specific complaints. And uh, again, the tetany or hypocalcemic convulsions can again become common in this age group. So one needs to recognize uh, that these findings could also be secondary to uh, vitamin D deficiency and rickets. So uh, if you are dealing with the nutritional rickets, you need, the only investigations you need are the basic calcium phosphate ALP, you require a radiological evaluation and other investigations, even LFT, KFT, serum electrolytes, VBG, you, I would not say they are mandatory. Yeah, we do it because for most of us, it is so they are not expensive. They are universally available. So most of the time in a hospital, we would be as a routine doing LFT, KFT, serum electrolyte. But really speaking, if it is you're sitting in a periphery and you're resource constrained, you don't mandatorily need it. All you need is the three calcium phosphate ALP and an X-ray. And certainly, certainly you do not require PTH 25 OST and 125 vitamin D at this particular stage. Okay. And this is all you need. And you know your calcium can be normal or it may be low. Phosphate is invariably low while ALP tends to be high and radiology is very, very clear. Uh, just a few uh, caveats to keep in mind. Make sure your phosphate is fasting. The age-related normal levels keep varying. The phosphate levels tend to be higher in infancy as compared to older children. And sometimes serum phosphate level may uh, be high in nutritional records because there might be a secondary PTS resistance. However, in such a situation, first rule of renal failure, because that is also a very likely cause of uh, high phosphate and can also cause records. And of course, uh, calcium, try to take a free-flowing sample, sometimes difficult in a young child with small veins because uh, squeezing and delayed processing can raise the ionized calcium. 
Principles of treatment of nutritional rickets. It might seem very nice because this is something one might teach undergraduate students, but we still see problems. So I'll just uh, lay out the principles. We need to give vitamin D. The dose uh, has been classified um, age-wise, which I'll talk about later, but minimum dose so far agreed upon is 2000 IU daily. And uh, we need to give treatment for minimum of six to 12 weeks. Some children require longer ther therapy so that we monitor and decide. And uh, calcium should routinely be given, goes with our uh, initial uh, slide that calcium and phosphate, uh, calcium and vitamin D together contribute towards causing nutritional rickets. Makes sense that you give both of them together. And uh, what is most important is before you treat, please go into the previous administration of calcium and vitamin D, document it very clearly and see if you can document the response to that therapy. And this is very important for you all because you are going to get those patients who will not respond. Most of the patients with nutritional rickets will respond beautifully to this therapy. They will not come to you. They, they are likely to come if it was a severe nutritional rickets and they have just started uh, kind of responding and the bones are still deformed. So you might still get nutritional rickets, but a lot of them will perhaps not come to you. So if they are coming to you, do take time out to dig out this history and build a kind of profile. See their serial calcium phosphate ALP and the excellence, the response to therapy. That itself will give you a lot of clues about the etiology of rickets. And uh, you must monitor response to therapy, especially if you are doing something like calcium first, you're just doing a basic investigation, you must monitor the response to therapy. This will help you uh, both decide the duration of therapy and also help you detect cases of that are not responding and are therefore non-nutritional in origin. And uh, another, a few other things, vitamin D, use polycalciferol or ergocalciferol if you must, but do not use active forms of vitamin D. They are not indicated. They are not needed. They are a lot more expensive. Also, they have a short half-life and uh, they have a more toxicity potential and they do not get stored in the body. They don't build up body stores. So not needed. All you need is cholecalciferol or if you want D2. Uh, both oral and parental routes are effective. Rate of rise of serum uh, 25 OH is faster with oral administration. So actually, there is no need for parental administration in most situations. In fact, what we have shown is even in patients with the malabsorption states, especially celiac disease, we, uh, which, where we had published our work, they respond so beautifully to oral vitamin D. There is no need really to give uh, parental vitamin D in most situations. Oral works very well. And both D2 and D3 are effective. D3, in a systematic review, it was shown that D D3 is likely to be more effective when intermittent doses are used, but likely to be maybe because of higher affinity of VDR for D3. But practically, D2, D3 both work very well. And in India, most of the formulations are D3. So we all end up using polycalciferol and it works very, very well. The single large doses are not used, thankfully, anymore, uh, anywhere. And are uh, not only are they not needed, they are harmful. Uh, what about daily versus intermittent administration? When the IAP guidelines, uh, which were published in 2021, were made, this issue was extensively discussed. And uh, we looked for evidence. Uh, do we give daily or do we give? In India, we get 60,000 IU sachets, which are very economical to use. Compliance can definitely be improved vis a vis daily therapy. Does it work? Does it not work? So while there was some evidence for older children, for infants, we lacked evidence. So uh, we had, uh, in the meanwhile, uh, we uh, completed and we recently published our work on infants with the vitamin D deficiency. And we compared uh, equivalent doses, 2,000 units uh, per day, orally, vis a vis 60,000 per month, which comes to equivalent doses. And that work is published recently in JPEM. And actually what we found, something that we found in another work which has been completed and is yet to be published, is on uh, older children where we gave 4,000 units per day, daily, versus again uh, 60,000 parentally. Uh, so, sorry, not parental, 60,000 every fortnight. So in both the cases we found, both regimes work very well. But raise, the rate of rise of 25 OHD was higher with the oral daily regime versus intermittent regime. And this we found in both groups of children. In fact, where we give 2,000 units per day 
versus the older children where we give 4,000 units per day. So even at four weeks, there was a statistically significant difference in 25 OST levels, which uh, further increased at 12 weeks. And what about safety? I think that is what we were more concerned with. What we found was with both regimes, whether you give orally or whether you give parental, uh, you give fortnightly intermittent doses, the urinary calcium creatinine ratio increases. And because our 25 OHD rise was higher with the daily dose, we actually found a higher incidence of uh, elevated urinary calcium creatinine ratio with daily dosing, visit visit intermittent dosing. However, this hypercalcemia and hypercalciuria in some of them was transient and it subsided within one week of stopping treatment. So what would be the clinical implications of that we need to keep in mind. So that's about nutritional records. So these were the guidelines for treatment of um, various guidelines and these are the latest IAP guidelines. I'm sure you've all seen them. Our guidelines, of course, right now say give 2,000 IU per day for infants for 12 weeks. It's not months. And for 6 to 12 months, one could consider equivalent doses given as weekly or monthly, followed by maintenance. And uh, for older children, we recommend 3,000 units per day for 12 weeks or 60,000 to weekly for a 5 uh, doses. So again, kind of equivalent dose. So this is what the IAP guidelines say, and there are, of course, the global consensus guidelines. All these guidelines indicate giving the combination of calcium and vitamin D. Please follow any of them. They'll work well. Uh, so um, having moving from nutritional rickets, when do you suspect non-nutritional rickets? So uh, which you can pick up on your history on examination, presence of chronic history or clinical features, suggestive of chronic liver or kidney disease, Alopecia, failure to thrive. Remember, failure to thrive can also occur in nutritional rickets, but as one of the features. Familial occurrence, especially in the setting of consanguinity, cataract, intellectual disability, acidosis, hypokalemia, nephrocalcinosis. One or more of these as a pointer, watch out. Or, as I said earlier, no, if there is no response to an adequate treatment for nutritional rickets, that is when you're going to suspect non-nutritional and then your initial evaluation is going to be quite different. So let's look at this case. This was a three-year-old boy from a non-consanguinous marriage who came to us with inability to walk independently. Um, he, he could walk holding onto objects from 18 months of age onward but was unable to walk uh, unsupported. And since then, he never really learned how to walk independently. Other milestones were okay. Progressive leg bowing, progressive loss of scalp hair from six months of age. Normal scalp hair at birth, complete alopecia at the presentation at three years, including eyebrows and eyelashes. Uh, no history suggestive of malabsorption, renal or hepatic problem, prolonged drug intake, it's nothing. Uh, reasonably short, height for age at minus three, that's four. BMI was relatively well maintained. No pallor, ictus, frank rickets, frontal bossing, wrist and ankle widening, genuverum, alopecia totalis. Skin, nails, dentition, everything else was normal. Systemic examination was normal. And this is how the investigation went. The calcium total as well as uh, ionized is low. The phosphate is low. ALP is markedly elevated. And in this case, we would go beyond, right? There are features suggestive of non-nutritional rickets. So here we went beyond, we did a PTH, which was elevated. We also did a 25 OSD, which was 18 nanogram per ml. And X-ray risk showed active rickets. Tell me, what do you think of this? Could it be nutritional rickets? Can we confidently rule out nutritional rickets from this? If you just look at the investigation and forget the history. But So if I'm just to look at investigation, then also uh, I agree, I may not confidently be able to rule it out. 25 OHD is 18. Most of our cases with rickets usually have vitamin D well below you know, 10, 12. But having said that, we did mention that nutritional rickets is a spectrum. So could it be that it is more calcium deficiency? A little less likely, but I would not entirely rule out nutritional rickets if only I had these investigations. But now look at it with the perspective of history, the alopecia in this child. The, that makes your not nutritional rickets less likely a possibility. Therefore, we are quite justified in doing more workup. So this child was initially given 10 sachets because vitamin D was still on the lower side, was given weekly 
uh, fractions of vitamin D at that time with calcium supplementation. What did we see? We did not see any clinical or radiological improvement. Calcium, phosphate, ALT were pretty much uh, unchanged. Look what is happening. Tubular reabsorption of phosphate is low. So there is phosphate urea going on here. Our PTH continued to be high. Uh, 25 OHD levels improved and 125 dihydroxy vitamin D levels were quite elevated. So what is our diagnosis? VDDR type 2. So we were reasonably confident that this is VDDR type 2 and this is how the child has behaved over time. So this child initially we had before we reached the diagnosis of VDDR2, we had given him calcirol and oral calcium. We did not really give much of an improvement in the child. After that, he was started on calcitriol and we kept increasing the dose of uh, calcitriol. Uh, he did improve symptomatically. He started walking independently, gained height, though his biochemical parameters, if you see, there was hardly any change. He just continued to be very well. But clinically, the family was happy that the child has started walking. That was one major milestone achieved. And then we realized we're giving him an expensive drug for patients who are poor and calcitriol does not come in my hospital supply. Uh, even affording a prolonged calcitriol therapy was uh, difficult. And at that time, we felt the child was behaving more or less not too bad, never did not have any seizures, hypercalcemic seizures. So we decided to shift him to oral Colicalciferol, high dose oral colicalciferol. And uh, surprisingly, the child seemed to do well on this. And over years, his parameters actually improved. And uh, radiological healing also started appearing, and the family was happy, and so were we. So uh, he actually started, this is our child at one of those ages. He started getting better. Just, but he required a high dose of uh, vitamin D and uh, calcium seemed to do well. We have not done. So these are his x-rays, December 2011, when he had come to us initially. And June 2013, reasonable degree of healing. May 2015, better healing. And this is he now. He uh, landed up in our clinic just a couple of months ago. He is now nearly 15. He has just about starting with his puberty. Testes have just started enlarging. And he is still taking, in between all those COVID years, he didn't turn up. He came back again. He seems to be happy. And he's maintained on 60,000 every two weeks. We want to do genetic studies. Let us see, because obviously he's behaved in a pretty decent manner for VDDR type 2, though there is a variation in the, in the phenotype of patients with VDDR type 2. But... Uh, we, we still don't have the genetic studies on him. So a VDDR type 2 is uh, one of the examples of calcipenic rickets. The, of course, the nutritional rickets is also calcipenic. The other types of calcipenic rickets, you know, vitamin D malabsorption states. Uh, in North India, we see a lot of celiac disease presenting as a, or associated with rickets as a primary or associated findings. You need to keep in mind when there is non-response and we ruled out uh, the liver, kidney, pancreas issues. Disorders of vitamin D metabolism become important and distal RT as the case already presented, indicated. So these are the inherited disorders of vitamin D metabolism. You're all uh, well aware of them. So if 25 OHD does not get converted to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, you, you have VDDR type. 1a okay and very rarely we can have vddr type 1b where the 25 hydroxylation does not occur okay so vitamin d2 there's a mutation loss of function mutation here leading to lack of formation of 25 ohd so that is much much rarer then vddr type 2 would be here either because of uh, loss of expression of VD, uh, vitamin D receptor, so that will be 2A, and 2B would be the VDR is okay, but the there's an overexpression of uh, heterogeneous uh, nucleotide ribonucleoprotein complex, which binds the VDR-125-dihydroxy vitamin D complex to the gene. 
And if there is overexpression of this, it competitively inhibits this binding and therefore again rare um, cause. So these are, and very, very rarely we also have VDDR3, which leads to increased metabolism of 25 OSD. So that gets degraded. So uh, both these situations uh, would present when either you're giving therapy to the patient and there's either a poor response to therapy or the there's an initial response, but there's a rapid fall in 25 OSD levels. But these are more rare disorders. So let's look at this case. One and a half year old girl presented with broad-based gait, also complains of pain in legs at night and uh, normal birth weight, no significant medical history, normal development. So here she is uh, presenting a little, uh, the symptoms started a little late. There's a history that father was physically disabled, confined to a wheelchair, had weak bones. That's all was known. No other significant family history. So she has a marked various deformity in bilateral knees and ankle. No other clinical features of the case. And she had, as is not unusual here, received multiple vitamin D sashes on previous occasions. So uh, her calcium was normal, both uh, total and uh, ionized. Phosphate was low. ALP was uh, elevated, modestly elevated. PTH was in the normal range. And fractional excretion of phosphate was, what do you think of 73% fractional yes. No, excretion is high. TRP is low, right? T it's the reverse would be TRP, right? The fractional excretion is low. So what is happening here? We have a PTH which is normal. In the previous case, the PTH was high. So moral of the story, if you have phosphaturia with high PTH, very likely PTH is the culprit. But if the PTH is normal and fractional excretion of the phosphate is still high, then you have to think of a primary phosphate wasting state. So this child underwent genetic studies and was found to have mutation of the FEX gene consistent with the diagnosis of X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. And then father was also found to have the same mutation. So managed with oral phosphate, calcitriol, and uh, still had persistent deformity and required a orthopedic uh, straightening. And she had it good response to therapy. So that's the most common cause of phosphopenic rickets. And if we look at the phosphopenic rickets, um, the most of the cases of phosphopenic rickets are because of increased renal phosphate wasting, which could be due to two broad mechanisms. One, the FGF23 levels are high and the renal wasting of phosphate is mediated by FGF23 uh, related issues. And Excellent uh, dominant or autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive hypophosphatemic rickets, all of them by some mechanism or other lead to elevation of FGF23 and so do tumor induced rickets, mercury albright syndrome, neurofibromatosis. The other possibility is primary defect in renal tubular phosphate absorption. And uh, an example here would be the, the Fantany syndrome. So, uh, it could be, or it could be, so the other disorder would be the HHRS, the hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria. So here there's a primary defect in renal tubular phosphate absorption, fanfany when it's associated with the other tubulopathy, and HHRS where it is primarily involving the phosphate reabsorption. Dietary phosphate deficiency is unusual, except in premature infants and sometimes young infants. Most of the time, if there is phosphopenic rickets, one is reasonably, one can reasonably well conclude it is likely to be a renal phosphate wasting. Okay, so these are the various disorders and the gene defects. So uh, you can see the X-linked, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, mercury albright, tumor induced, all of them are associated with high FGF23 levels if you are able to measure them. And all of them would have relatively normal for uh, the hypophosphatemic state or low uh, 125 dihydroxy vitamin D levels. Vis a vis HHRH, where there is a defect in the sodium phosphate co transporter, the FGF levels would be normal or low, but would be associated with a elevated 125 dihydroxy vitamin D level because of hypophosphatemia, which stimulates the 
formation of active form of vitamin D. And of course, Fantany syndrome would have uh, there's a proximal tubular dysfunction. So this is uh, the etiological profile of refractory rickets from uh, uh, a few centers in uh, India. It, of course, a lot depends on uh, who's following. If a nephrologist is following them, like the JIPMAR uh, is, uh, is paper was published by uh, the nephrologist. So we have much more of distal RTA here. And Wadia, I don't think Sudha is here. So again, distal RTA was very common. From Ames, New Delhi, distal RTA and hypophosphatemic rickets were almost equal in frequency. But in general, these first three disorders, hypophosphatemic rickets, not always mutation studies have been done. So cannot further subclassify on the basis of this. Distal RTA and VDDR, uh, they explain almost all our refractory rickets and with few others that came up in the series. So how do you have approach, uh, having said that, clinical approach to refractory rickets? So I think it begins from the age at presentation. VDDRs will usually present in infancy uh, with failure to thrive, bony deformities. RTS also would present in infancy or first couple of years. Hypophosphatemic rickets usually might present in a slightly older child. Whenever you have features of uh, uh, calciopenia, numbness, tingling, paresthesia, proximal myopathy, technique, you can reasonably certain it's a very strong pointer towards calcipenic rickets, whereas hypophosphatemic rickets, there will be more severe involvement of the weight-bearing uh, bones. So severe lower limb involvement, there is a, a dental decay, dental abscesses, and the bones tend to be relatively dense as compared to um, calcipenic uh, rickets because there is no hyperparathyroidism. So, uh, of course, the very obvious clinical pointers to chronic renal disease, the triad of anemia, hypertension, short stature, very strong pointer, chronic liver disease, of course, hysteresis or malabsorption, anti-epileptic, polyuria, polydipsia, failure to thrive, especially with muscle weakness, do think of RTA, and alopecia is a very uh, straightforward uh, pointer towards VDDR2, and history of similar involvement, parental consanguinity, think of all inherited disorders, so if you have a child with rickets like deformity, basic investigation is the first thing, including creatinine, X-ray, ALP, calcium phosphate. If your ALP is normal, you are unlikely to be dealing with rickets. Think of other possibilities that can mimic rickets. Heel rickets, brown disease, skeletal dysplasia, hypophosphatasia. We did have an example yesterday in the quiz of uh, a case, uh, I think spondylofacial dysplasia which was uh, presenting as rickets, masquerading as rickets. If the ALP is high, look for clues for resistant rickets, alopecia, polyuria, proteinuria, hypocalcemia. If there are any clues for resistant rickets or not, if there are no clues, we treat as nutritional rickets, but you must always repeat the ALP and X-ray after one to two months just to follow up the patient and, and document healing. If there is no healing, again, you need to think in terms of non-resistant rickets. If we have initial clues, go ahead about possible non-nutritional uh, etiology, do the PTH. And if it's elevated, work for calcipenic rickets and investigate for phosphopenic rickets if normal or minimally high. Having said that, in Indian scenario, it is not uncommon to find a combination. So a patient with hypophosphatemic rickets because he's not walking much, he's not going out, may also have a secondary vitamin D deficiency. So those kind of combinations are very likely possible here. So uh, just remember, urinary phosphate high in all forms of rickets except CRF. High urinary phosphate with normal PTH, phosphate wasting. High urinary phosphate with high PTH indicates phosphaturia is secondary to the high PTH. Hypercalciuria is not very common, at least in nutritional rickets, unless there is Fantany syndrome present. Fantany also not every case will have hypercalciuria. So typically hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis, distal RTA. Hypercalciuria would also be seen in HHRN, very occasionally with other tubulopathies. It can be seen in the other proximal renal tubulopathies. 
so keep in mind, as I said, PTH is a very fragile molecule. Improper storage and transport conditions can lead to falsely lower value, especially if you're not doing it in-house and you're sending the sample outside. Phosphate levels are age-dependent and affected by feeding. Small things which make a difference in your diagnosis. Just a summary of uh, the differences between calcitinic and phosphopenic rickets. Muscle weakness, bone pain, tetany, much more common in calcitinic. Muscle weakness may be somewhat present in phosphopenic thickens, but not uh, too bad as compared to calcipenic thickens. Enamel hypoplasia likely in calcipenic, while in phosphopenic, dense bones are, uh, uh, dental abscesses are more likely. Investigation-wise, calcium, of course, would be normal in phosphopenic thickens. Phosphate is low in both. ALP elevated in both, more so in calcipenic. PTH, of course, Markedly elevated in calcipenic, normal a little high in phosphopenic. Osteopenia, likely in calcipenic. Dense bones, phosphopenic. So these are the radiological features of phosphopenic rickets. Coarse trabeculations, rickets involving more likely the medial condyle and thick cortices. So how do you further evaluate calcipenic rickets? You have your 25 OST levels. If these are low, you're either dealing with malabsorption or VDDR type 1B, which is rare. If these are normal, first rule out RTA. Once RTA is ruled out and acidification test is normal, you look at 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Normal 25 OHD and uh, low. 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, you are dealing with VDDR type 1, very likely 1A, rarely B, and VDDR type 3. If it's elevated, 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is uh, inappropriately normal or elevated VDDR type. And of course, if acidification test is abnormal, you're dealing with distillate. If you're dealing with the phosphopenic rickets, so we look at first TMP GFR and document phosphate wasting. Okay. So once phosphate wasting is documented, look at FGF23. If you have access to it, it is available. But remember, FGF23 assays can be tricky. The, there are age variations in the normal uh, levels. So, But if it's available to you, it's wonderful. If it's elevated, it gives you very nicely. You can classify your disorders. Elevated FGF23, think in terms of XLH, ADHR, ARH, uh, the autosomal uh, recessive, and others. If it is not high, then you have to first test for HHRH. And then other possibility would be the Fentany syndrome, then disease. So these are the management principles of these disorders. VDDR 1A, the block is from conversion from 25 hydroxy to 125. So physiological replacement doses by alpha calcidol or calcitriol, because it is one hydroxylation that is. Uh, not taking place. Just give physiological replacement works well. VDDR type 2. Now this is the phenotype varies. You can try large doses of calcitriol or alpha calcidol and as we did in our case, the it was just uh, vitamin D was given. In severe cases where there is may not be a response, intravenous calcium would be needed. So uh, VDDR 3 is of course very rare and so is 1B. Uh, Anticonvulsant malabsorption state would require supplementation with cholecalciferol. The dose needs to be titrated as per the severity of the disorder and is likely to change with our management of the primary disease. This will RTA, as we amply saw, requires alkali, potassium replacement along with thiazides and calcitriol. The hypophosphatemic rickets would require the FTAF23 mediated ones would require oral phosphate supplementation along with calcitriol. And we now have uh, Burosumab, the FGF23 antibody, uh, approved for treatment of X-link hypophosphatemic rickets, available in India, um, very expensive. HHRH, on the other hand, requires only phosphates. You don't want to give them calcitriol. They're going to have even worsening of hypercalciuria. And uh, finding a tumor, identification and section, easier said than done. Often the tumors are small and you really need to hunt for them. And uh, McKinney Albright and Fankany require uh, McKinney Albright is like XLH, and Fankany again requires treatment with alkali, potassium, phosphate, whatever we are using, we supplement there. So, 
Before I end, just one last slide. Remember, all deformed bones are not rickets. And time and again, these cases are managed as rickets. And uh, what is this case? 25 OSD levels were more than 160 nanogram per ml, thanks to all the vitamin D the child had received. And this was actually metaphysical dysplasia. So I think, I think that's all. So uh, just few clinical clues, including non-response to previously administered vitamin D helps suspect non-vocational rickets. In absence of these clues, it is practical to treat all cases of rickets as nutritional after radiological and biological confirmation. And characteristic combination of biochemical findings along with clinical and radiological clues will help you reach a diagnosis in patients with non-vocational rickets. So this was our, our another family with VGDR2. Where, unfortunately, the family, this is the boy, the other two are girls. The treatment was nicely ignored. The family was worried when the boy also started losing hair. And that is when they came to us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anshu. Fantastic deliberation. Really making the things very crystal clear to all, all of us. Uh, the house is open for discussion. Any comments or questions? Just to start the ball rolling, uh, did you find in the trial comparing the intermittent therapy with uh, small dose, daily doses, and uh, intermittent large doses? Did you find in the difference in recovery pattern, like decline in the client positive and the uh, bone healing? Okay, so uh, I'll this uh, the observation on this was same in both the studies that is, for young infants as well as the older children. The response was great in both, and I'll tell you where they differed. The, so the ALP, the normalization of calcium and phosphate levels, the normalization of ALP and PTH levels, we measured all of them, happened almost similarly in both the groups. There was no statistically significant difference in the levels at baseline, four weeks and 12 weeks. These are the four points where we measured it. There was no significant difference. The only difference was in serum 25 OSD levels and in both the groups. So, and they started rising much better in the daily group. And what was worrying me was actually the finding of uh, hypercalciuria. Though it was transient, even with daily 2000 IU, it is, we thought it's a safe dose. 2000 IU per day. Um, I think nearly 14% of our children, if I remember right, in that infant group, had hypercalciuria. It was transient. It uh, subsided, we checked them again one week to two weeks after the stopping treatment. But that is what was a little uh, worrying. What will be the significance of that? Or should we be trying lower doses? I, I don't know. But uh, otherwise, apart from that, there was no difference. They were very well, even in young infants. And uh, the study on infants had good 80 children in both groups. Basically. Uh, second question is, how do you... Uh, treatment we find does it increase the records because of dietary calcium deficiency in practice? How do you diagnose we, dietary uh, We have studies from uh, Mrs. Bharti, the landmark study for SUPHI, how it classified records. Yeah, and uh, we have studies from Bangladesh, Shakopi, uh, South Africa. How frequently it is? Because we keep on discussing that actually. Uh, calcium uh, deficiency. Yeah, we, we so, did a study on the uh, animal rats and then the rats to refine what is really existent or not and the daily happens with the uh, uh, very low dose of uh, calcium being given to the rats and then the uh, typical negative changes in the bone labs. They are a vital state seen. So it is a reality, but how frequently it is actually. What we found, actually all our children are not taking calcium. More, in fact, invariably as per the age, uh, specific recommendation, they are just not taking calcium. So the one of the works that uh, we had uh, published was only on this. On uh, Actually, that work had two components. One was it compared the calcium intake and uh, vitamin D levels in patients with rickets and those without rickets, with healthy children. So actually what we found was vitamin D levels were also different in two groups. But surprisingly, not statistically significant. There was a reasonable degree of difference. So I would say they do tend to have lower levels. But the main difference was calcium level in the groups. 
either the calcium not calcium level but calcium levels are not an indicator at all the calcium intake was really low and it is that combination and that is why the second paper based on that of the second part of the same work was giving keeping with only calcium with only vitamin d or a combo the combo worked best of the three there are the, so many other papers related to that but what we found was our patients invariably have a combination and calcium deficiency and which by the calcium deficiency across multiple instances. They are all, apart from infancy, they all tend to be. Yeah, that's true that uh, really the, the calcium the, uh, absorption is reduced from the skin only with the fear of uh, product of the That's what happened. That's the because there are hardly two studies of calcium absorption based on structural cell cells. So, yes, most of our, our, our own works, the levels had uh, varied, and uh, most of them had levels very ten, except one of the works, which I don't know. And the levels initial studies were done at Inmas Timarko when 25 OED assays were not very common, and they did RIA at that time. And then I think Dr. Marwa, in the same box, he was a collaborator, did the uh, perhaps did not, then they did on Eclia, if I remember right. And the levels he found were very different by two methods. So that was another problem. He had some samples left over from the previous, and he told me, This is what has happened, and the levels are very different. So it's assay dependent also, but having said that, most of them have very 10, I would say. And uh, in the children with hypocalcemic seizures have lower levels. Much lower than this. Five, six. Yes, which. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. Uh, you're talking about this case? Yes, yes. Absolutely. I agree. In fact, that is one point I kept on bringing out. You must inquire into the previous doses because this is what happens. These children don't respond. How will they? And so they keep going from one doctor to the other and they end up having the easiest thing to do is load them with vitamin D. And sometimes, I'm sorry to say, orthopedic colleagues, at least in my own institute, um, believe in doing everything mega. So they end up, a uh, lot of them actually give huge doses of vitamin D. And so I mean, that is just from my institute, so I'm not uh, kind of generalizing a statement, but perhaps that. Uh, so what we did in this particular work, the which I'm yet to publish in children, where we give four thousand units per day every day. Uh, this we did for the other next RCT, which is yet to be published. Four thousand per day oral versus uh, no, intermittent. I'm coming. So we would cut it and squeeze it and give it to the child. The children did not swallow. Yeah, around, uh, we do the same. We cut, squeeze, and give. It works well. Calcitriol, as well as even vitamin D, when we give 4,000 units. Yes, because that has to be done at home with the. the Our mothers worked it out pretty well because this study, we it was shown to them to nip it with the. The soft gels were nipped at the top and they put the squeeze it on a, onto a spoon and give. I tried the same thing, but once I it and then it came on my finger. So uh, then uh, uh, I, 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 I tried a lot. It is, it is messy, but uh, it, it worked. It worked. And it worked better than the intermittent regime. That didn't work. So I agree. So 4,000, uh, given 4,000 units per day, we didn't find any other option because 800 IU per ml syrup again becomes a large dose. 4,000 was a little difficult for us to give. And uh, this is what we decided to give. We tried it a few times and it worked well. And most of our mothers managed it pretty well. They gave it at home and the response was actually better in that group as compared to the intermittent therapy. So, thank okay. you. Uh, uh, you know, the flow chart is flow verification test as a, a routine approach. Not always needed. Not always needed. 
agreed in like in a case like this when the things are so clear if in presence of acidosis if the ph is in that case was 7.1 or something there is no doubt not needed and then make the flowchart myself sorry so that was <laughs> should have made it um, Calcitriol may not always be required actually in Santani. What you need is alkali, potassium, phosphate replacement. Our own nephrologist, this is how are managed more by our nephrology team, and uh, we are not managing this. Yes, so perhaps uh, we it, don't want it. But like uh, capital doesn't get normalized once you be born. Yes. So the capital is normalized, capital is normalized. It's only this not much you only got one time. Point well taken. Vijay was saying something. Management. Vijay was saying something. Yeah, your uh, observation uh, in that 4,000 unit versus uh, uh, mini uh, large doses uh, study, which Sushil also referred to, brings to my mind Dr. Raman Marwa's paper on uh, uh, the very wide uh, availability uh, of uh, 20, uh, the 60,000 unit sachets, uh, ranging from very, very poor uh, amount contained in a, in a sachet. Uh, versus uh, good. Uh, so I wonder whether the daily preps are more reliable and therefore you've got uh, manifestation of pretty uh, high uh, um, uh, dosage to the children Which rather than the sachets. Respondent. They all respondent. If no, I'm agreeing agree with individually. individually. I'm agreeing with you, Andrew, in the sense that maybe we don't need as much dose as is written. In the terms of the 2000, yeah. I'm, I'm telling two things. One, I'm agreeing with you that the 2000 may be quite generous. Um, secondly, that the sachets are very variable in their uh, constitution. That's uh, two things I'm yeah. suggesting. Yeah. Uh, Sushil also is very. Brands, uh, which was used yeah. in that study. The yeah. study done by so with the Ravan Mark. And it ranged from 40,000 to 93,000 units uh, per. Those actually the marketed dose, so there's a huge variability of that, and the same thing was found in the in US also the fortified food. Same thing was found in the US also. So it's a generalized thing actually. Depends on how the methods are being. I'm not sure. So actually, what I, I absolutely agree with you. We made sure we gave only a single brand. The hospital procured it at one, and uh, we gave a single brand. But having said that, even though yeah, there is a variability, but whatever it was, it worked. It worked very well. So even though brand variability would be lower, it may not be sixty thousand. It might be God knows what. But whatever it was, the PTH fall, the ALP fall, everything was great. Healing was there. So if I have to, what we found was you can use them. You can very well use those sachets even in infant. Those the small study with limited fall, the limitations of a small study. You can, never can use one small study to make a generalized statement. That will never do. But what we found was it works. I would not say we can use them. I would say it works and maybe merits a further glass of time. Yeah. yeah, I just want to say that in Russia, the one is that uh, there's uh, 11 3 years of the ground. That's so one of the two things that I think of for the body is there. It's got seven ground, the previous one. So one has to take more from uh, what they are not here for the gas access. That's the point I think. This time, I have a comment uh, on the hypercalciuria in those infants. Yes. Actually, I think it's uh, it's known that in infancy, the urinary calcium uh, is, of course, higher that you know better than me. Uh, but it's very uh, variable uh, can, and it can go into apparent hypercalciuria looking ranges for a long time in infancy and early childhood. So yes. uh, it might be 
Yes. Uh, it might be tough to interpret. And of course, we did the spot urinary calcium creatinine ratio. We certainly did not measure 24 hour urinary calcium excretion, which for a young infant would require catheterization. We would that was never even considered. So with all the limitations of spot urinary calcium creatinine ratio, what we were looking at is the relative change. We did it at baseline to four weeks to twelve weeks. So there was a progressive increase with all its limitations uh, in the urinary calcium creatinine ratio. So it is something you can't ignore. And it's many times that hypercalciuria, not invariably I would say, but many times was actually associated with transient hypercalcemia. So then you have to, it becomes much more sinister. So 